we read stories about how people listening to the Buddha would gain the Dharma eye, sometimes gain full awakening while listening to a Dharma talk. And it inspires several questions. One is, why aren't we gaining awakening listening to Dharma talks? And the other one is, they do that. After all, gaining the Dharma eye, gaining awakening, requires that you have all eight factors in the Noble Eightfold Path. And how do you get those simply listening to a Dharma talk? And part of the reason why we don't gain awakening, of course, is that we don't have the Buddha giving the talks. He knew his listeners a lot better than I know you all. And he could tailor the talks precisely to their needs. But he also talked about the quality of the listener, the attitudes you bring. And there's one place where he lists five. One is not looking down on the speaker, not looking down on the, the talk itself, and also not looking down on yourself. In other words, you have an attitude of respect toward the teacher, toward the Dhamma, and you respect yourself that you are capable of practicing the Dharma that you're hearing. The other two qualities are singleness of mind and appropriate attention. A singleness of mind starts out, of course, by being focused totally on the talk. But how do you move from that kind of singleness of mind, say, to right concentration? And then with appropriate attention. It usually means seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. But it's interesting that when the Buddha describes the Four Noble Truths in that context, it's basically saying, this is stress, this is the origination of stress, this is the cessation of stress, and this is the path leading there. The implication being that you're actually seeing these things in your own mind. So it's not just thinking about the Four Noble Truths, it's looking at your own experience and applying those truths to what you're actually experiencing. It's good to keep this in mind when you think about one of the ways in which people were prepared for the Four Noble Truths by the Buddha, in what was called his graduated discourse or step-by-step -step discourse. There are stories about people coming to see the Buddha, and he would start with a talk on generosity, talk on virtue, then the rewards of generosity and virtue in heaven, and then the drawbacks, and he said even the degradation involved in sensuality. Because that's what those rewards in heaven are all about, sensual pleasures. And then seeing renunciation as rest, as peace. When you listen to those topics, then the Buddha would see that you were ready for the Four Noble Truths. He would teach them in non-listening, applying those truths to your experience. You'd get awakening. It's an interesting psychological dynamic. He starts by talking about things that are very close to you. We've all had some experience being generous. We've all had some experience being virtuous. And we know that it feels good deep down inside to do these things. And so the Buddha is affirming that. So he's helping to give rise to a sense of self-respect. And you respect him for pointing out the goodness of these things. Even more so when he talks about the rewards of these things in heaven. Gives you a sense of joy, that you have some goodness to you, that you are capable of practicing the Dharma. And then he turns the tables on you and says, okay, even those rewards, even though they're very good, very enjoyable, they have their drawbacks. But not just drawbacks, he says degradation, the fact that the mind is feeding on sensuality. He wants you to see that you're feeding on something that's really lower than you deserve. You should aim higher. And then when he talks about renunciation, renunciation doesn't mean just giving up. It means looking for pleasure in things that are not sensual. This, of course, would be the pleasure of right concentration. That right there gives you some idea that that 
one-pointed focus or that singleness of mind that you have in the talk. This is how it gets converted into right concentration, because you're focused. And now you're focused on something that is not central, and you're beginning to develop right view. We talk about the graduated discourses leading from mundane right view, the principle of karma, the goodness of generosity, and then taking you to transcendent right view and the Four Noble Truths. But it's also doing more. It's developing other factors in the path as well. You have a sense of well-being, but you also have a sense of heedfulness, the danger of sensuality, and the desirability of looking for a pleasure someplace else. Looking for your happiness someplace else, like focusing on the breath right here, right now. So this is how the Buddha gets more of the path going in his listeners. In the case of some of those listeners, it might have been pretty challenging. The most dramatic example, of course, is the time that Devadatta gets the king to get some of his archers to kill the Buddha. The plan was that one archer would kill the Buddha, and then the archer, after doing that, was told to escape by a certain route. Well, there would be two archers waiting for him along that route. They would kill him, and they were told to escape by another route. Well, there would be four archers waiting to kill them, and so on, up to eight archers to kill the four. The first archer comes. He sees the Buddha, and he's frozen with fear. He realizes this is not something he really wants to do. It's already that fear he has. It shows that he has some sense of right and wrong. So the Buddha extends goodwill to him and tells him to come in and see him. So he puts down his bow and arrow, and he comes to see the Buddha. The Buddha gives a graduated discourse, and we, this is one of those times where you wish the re discourse was recorded. Because it's never recorded in the canon. It's precisely what the Buddha had to say on these topics. You got the impression that with each person he would tailor his instructions to that particular person's needs. So you wonder what he would say to this person about generosity and virtue. When I listen to the story, I'm reminded of a short story I read one time about a, a kid who had joined a gang in the inner city. And the gang needed some money, and they talked him into trying to steal something from his mother. And so he sneaks into the house at night, and he walks past a part of the kitchen where he actually helped his mother when he was a little kid. And he has this pang of regret that he used to have a life of goodness. And now he feels far away from that. I imagine that's how the archer felt. He must have known goodness, he must have known generosity and virtue when he was younger. And then he took on a job as a hired killer and got far away from that. So imagine what the Buddha would have to say to get him thinking in good terms about generosity, about virtue. He must have had some goodness in him. And so the Buddha is focusing on that, bringing that out, so he can give that guy a sense of self-respect. He talks about the rewards of virtue, but then the, the drawbacks, even of those rewards. You can imagine the guy realized he had stepped to the edge of the abyss and now was going to pull back. You can think about his gratitude to the Buddha, his willingness to be, open his heart to what the Buddha had to say. So this is that. It's one of those cases where you wish you knew precisely what the Buddha had said to the, this person. It would have been a great lesson in the Dharma. But then the question is, how about us? What lessons should we draw from this? Well, one is the attitude you bring to the meditation. To get the mind into concentration requires two things. One is self-respect. This is why we have the contemplation of virtue, the contemplation of generosity, recollection of generosity, recollection of virtue, as themes to give yourself that sense of self-respect, that sense of joy in the practice, that you are competent. Remember that story by John Sawat, noting how grim the meditators were at the Insight Meditation Society. They chalked it up to the fact that they didn't have any background in 
the Buddhist attitude towards generosity and virtue. Otherwise, they would have come to the meditation with a much more joyful attitude. But at the same time, when the Buddha starts talking about the drawbacks of sensuality, that's where you have to bring in the principle of heedfulness. You can't live just for the rewards of being virtuous, just for the rewards of being generous. Because those things can pull you down. Remember the Buddha's image taking a little dirt under his fingernail and saying, which is more, the dirt under my fingernail or the dirt in the entire world? Well, of course, it's the dirt in the entire world is much more. The dirt under his fingernail is only a little tiny bit. He said in the same way, those who are born as devas and then who go on either to being devas or to being human beings after that are comparable to the dirt under his fingernail. Those who fall a lot further or like the dirt of the entire earth. You think about that. You're way up high as a day, but all of a sudden you drop really low. So it should inspire a sense of heedfulness and sangwega, that the concerns of your life so far don't guarantee that you will be able to maintain your status as a human being, or improve your status to be a deva, and then stay there. They have their drawbacks. They have their dangers. When you think about that, you start thinking about looking elsewhere for your happiness. And where is the elsewhere? It's right here, as you inhabit the body from within. The pleasure that comes from focusing on the breath, the rapture that can come from focusing on the breath. This is safety. This is peace. And when you have that sense of peace and well-being, okay, then you're ready to continue with this theme of heedfulness, because even the concentration can't guarantee anything unless you combine it with the rest of the path. You use the concentration to understand where it is that you're causing unnecessary stress and suffering for yourself. What are you doing? What are you holding on to? Why do you cling? Try to apply those Four Noble Truths to what you're doing right now. It seems too abstract to think in those terms. Just remind yourself of the questions that go with them. Where is the stress right now? And you remember what the Buddha said, the stress lies in the clinging. Okay, where is the clinging right now? What kind of craving are you engaged in right now that leads you to cling? Or your state of concentration, is it as peaceful and as calm as it could be? Can you detect any? Disturbance in there, not disturbance from outside, disturbance from within the concentration itself. In other words, you're looking directly at these things. The, remember the way the Buddha expressed it under the topic of appropriate attention. This is stress. This is the origination of stress. The this, this, this. Look right here. These things are showing themselves right here. And the Buddha's told you what to do with them, what the duties are. Are you doing your duties? Are you doing something else? So this should give you an, an idea of what was going on when the Buddha was giving those Dharma talks that led people to get awakening. And maybe you'll never get a chance to hear a Dharma talk that's precisely like that for you, but you can talk to yourself in these ways to give yourself a sense of confidence reflecting on your generosity and your virtue, a sense of heedfulness when you think about the drawbacks of sensuality, an appreciation of getting the mind to be still in concentration. And you see renunciation as rest, and then start applying those Four Noble Truths. So maybe by listening to your own Dharma talk inside, you can get a glimpse of the deathless as well. <laughs>